well, we are at the end of our fast, so who's hungry? <laughs> oh, goodness. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, this has been an incredible fast for me. This is uh, actually, I was thinking back, and this is my 17th year doing a corporate fast with a church. Um, yeah, it's been 17 years I've been doing these uh, 21 days of fasting. And I got to tell you that this year was probably one of the highlights for me. Um, the Heart Issues sermon series was absolutely incredible. And then also this concept of not just fasting, but also feasting. That was absolutely a game changer for me this year. But you know, as I was thinking about the fasts that I've done in the past, I, I did think, of, think about the highlights, but there were a couple of lowlights too. Um, I want to share one of those lowlights with you this morning. So I was serving at a church, and uh, me and a group of guys, we decided to fast together. And we were going to hold each other accountable. And for 21 days, we were going to fast meats and sweets. Yeah, easy, right? <laughs> Meats and sweets, all right? So we're going to eat like gerbils for 21 days. <laughs> and this is what we decided to do. So day one comes by. All right, it's kind of tough. All right, well, you, know, you keep rolling through it. Day five comes by, and we're just about ready to quit. All right, five, five days, we're done. We push through, though. Well, we were going to lunch together, a group of about four or five of us guys. We were going to lunch together. And uh, one guy, though, while we were all going down in our energy and our passion, and we were like, man, I don't know if we can do this, this one guy was just so happy all the time. Have you ever met some, like, really happy people, like, at all times? It doesn't matter what it is. You pull an all-nighter in college, and they wake up the next morning, hello, everybody. They're just absolutely happy all the time. This guy, oh, my goodness, so much energy, so much life. And we're thinking, okay, he's like Jesus, and we're like the other guy. Um, <laughs> and, and so we all were going to lunch together, except for this guy. He was actually uh, staying back a little bit. One day, though, we come back from lunch early, and we had to get rushed to a meeting. So we come back, and we get, go to the back of the church, and we see this guy standing outside the doors of the church, right next to a trash can with two hot dogs in his hands. <laughs> right? Not only that, we're watching him take the biggest bite out of one of the hot dogs. And so we're all in this car, and we pull up like the SWAT team. We're like, whoa, whoa. So we whip the car around. Everybody hops out. We run to him. We're like, bro, what are you doing? And he's like, oh. So he spits out the hot dog that was in his mouth. He's like, what are you talking about? We're like, bro, we're fasting meats and sweets. We're not supposed to eat meats and sweets. And he says, oh, I wasn't eating meat. I'm like, what, like a veggie dog or something? So I'm like, what is this? And he says, no, I wasn't eating the hot dog. I was just chewing the hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you guys think it's funny. <laughs> this guy, for the duration of our fast, was chewing on meat and then spitting it out. He was coming as close as you possibly can come to cheating on the fast. I'm going to call it a cheat right now, all right? So if it's been 21 days and you've been doing that, it's a great day for you to start over and do it the right way. <laughs> Well, you know, what's interesting is, um, you know, he's, he's an amazing pastor and leader now. He's probably watching online a little bit later, so I'm not going to share his name. Um, but you know, what's interesting is that my friend actually fell into a percentage of people that really, they start off strong, but then they kind of die out. And here's the interesting thing about that percentage of people. A large majority of us, if not all of us, fall into this same percentage of people. As a matter of fact, today is the 24th day of the year, and at this moment, 65% of New Year's resolutions have failed. 65% today. Now, if we wait until after the Super Bowl, that number goes to 80%. <laughs> Wonder why. <laughs> And then if we look at the end of the year, that number becomes over 97% of New Year's resolutions have failed. 
So this fast has been incredible for me because we've talked about success goals. What are the right goals to set? You know, as I've been thinking about it though, even though we're trying to set our success goals and we're in church and we're coming and we're hearing the word of the Lord and we're worshiping together, it's very easy for us to fall into that percentage of people who start off incredibly strong and then fizzle out as the year goes by. So the good news for you today is the odds are against you. <laughs> and even though the odds are against you, there's something that we can do to put the odds in our favor. I hadn't really noticed this in the scriptures before until I was preparing for this sermon, but I believe God has shown me something in the scriptures that's gonna allow us and help us charge all year round. Now, before I tell you how to put the odds in your favor, though, let me tell you what the problem is. Actually, let me show you what the problem is. See, we all start off the beginning of the year, beginning of a decision, begin of, beginning of setting goals, setting success goals. We all start off like this match here, and we're all on fire, ready to go. And we've got this flame burning, this passion burning, but then it burns out. You see, what happened to my friend is what happens to 65% of us today, 80% of us after the Super Bowl, and 97% of us by the end of the year, we burn out. So how, how do we make sure that we do not burn out? Well, the first thing we need to do is we need to see what are some of the things that causes us to burn out? And is there anybody else in the Bible that has fallen into this 65% today, 80% by the Super Bowl, 97% by the end of the year? The answer is yes. Yes, just about every single person that we read about in the Bible has had this moment happen in their lives. But I want to bring our attention to the first mention of this, the very first mention of a group of people or person who burnt out. So let's go ahead and read about this in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter three. And Andrew, I'm gonna have you read verses one through three for us. Sure. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord, had, the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. So now here's the setting of this. We've got Adam and Eve in this beautiful, beautiful garden, perfect conditions. And here comes this tempter, the serpent. Satan comes and tempts Eve. And there was only one thing that Adam and Eve were not supposed to do, which was eat from that tree. And we see that the serpent comes and he brings Eve's attention to that tree. Now, we're going to keep reading because the tempter comes and he tempts her. He keeps having this conversation with her. And I think by having this in the scriptures, we actually are able to pull out the strategies against us. We're able to pull out what is coming against us that makes us burn out. And I saw three different things in this passage of scripture three things, and they all build on top of each other. So let's talk about this first one in those first couple of verses. The first thing that the enemy did is he tried to get Eve to doubt what God had said. And we burn out when we doubt what God has spoken to us. How do I know this? It's when he said, are you sure that the Lord said you weren't supposed to do this? Are you sure that the Lord wasn't supposed to do that? And so what's the goal of doubt? Well, the goal of doubt is to blur the lines, blur the lines between what's right and what's almost right. That's what happens with doubt. The very first thing, this is the strategy. These are the cheat codes, by the way. I'm giving you the defensive strategy for the game. I'm giving you the offensive strategy for the game. We can come into this game and win because we're now getting a glimpse of the strategies. These are the cheat codes. And the first thing that the enemy tries to do is bring doubt. 
And in your life, the very first thing that the enemy is going to try to do after you've encountered the Lord, after you've made the decision, I'm not going back, after you've made the decision, I'm going to keep worshiping as hard as I can, the very first thing that happens is to blur the lines between what you know is right and what's almost right. But it builds on there. Tom, can you read for us Genesis chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, please? You won't die, (laughs) the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. So the second thing that we see here is that we burn out when we choose to disbelieve. When we disbelieve, we burn out. And here's how this works. You start out with doubt. Yeah, you know, this whole thing about being a priest and because, yeah, I think I got it. I'm not really sure. The longer you stay there, though, the longer you entertain that, now it becomes disbelief. And now here comes the strategy. No, you won't. Everything is going to be fine. You, you, no, God didn't really mean that. He really meant this. And the goal, the goal that we find with disbelieving is for us to believe what we think instead of what is true. The goal of disbelief is to get us to believe what we think instead of believing in what is true. So doubt blurs those lines. And then now we start believing things that really aren't true. Because we can't really tell the difference between what's right and what's Almost right. So let's keep reading. Jean-Marc, why don't you read uh, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6 for us. Verse 6 says, The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it too. So the third thing, the third strategy that we see here is that we burn out when we get distracted. Now, Tom uh, Goodlett spoke a few months ago about distraction, and he gave this really cool point. I always thought that the opposite of distraction was focus. If I want to not be distracted, I've just got to focus, and I just got to grit my teeth and focus as hard as I can. But really, in the essence of the word distraction, the opposite of distraction is traction. And so we see that when we get distracted, we just get on the wrong track. And so when we start with doubt and we don't deal with doubt, and now our vision is blurred because we don't know what's right and what's almost right, and we let that grow, and then we start believing the wrong things, now we get distracted and we're moving on the wrong track. We start moving on the wrong track, and we do not know how far we've gone until we recognize how much of that fruit we've eaten. And so here Eve is, and she's eaten from this fruit, and she gave it to Adam, and he ate some of the fruit too. And now here comes all the problems in the world because doubt became disbelief and ended with distraction. We're on the wrong path. And doubt, disbelief, and distraction will always burn us out. We will always burn out when we let doubt grow into disbelief and we let disbelief grow into distraction. The goal of the enemy is to get you to burn out. It's okay if you're still a match, that's great, but the goal is to get you to burn out. But today we're gonna talk about how do we maintain our flame? How do we make sure that we do not burn out? That's the good news today. The good news is God gives us a strategy. God actually shows us how to win, how to have true success. We've gotten the strategy of the defense, and we're on offense. We know exactly what they're doing, so we know exactly how to beat them. And so now we know, we know how to win and have success. But before we go into that, I actually want to ask the team uh, a question, and guys, let's get a little real. Let's get a little real today. Um, So my, my question is, Is there a time in your life where you've experienced burnout? 
Is there a time in your life? You're just talking to me and a couple thousand people. That's it. <laughs> Jean-Marc, you, you look like you're ready to go, bro. <laughs> sure, why not? Uh, no pressure. Uh, yeah, there's several times. I, I mean, the first time that comes to mind was uh, during, during our pregnancy, or during Michelle's pregnancy with Olivia. That time was, I mean, she went through five days of labor and talk about burnout. Um, yeah, we were just depleted at that point. They were like, okay, drive here. Okay, do this. And we were just zombies. Like, okay, sure, just tell us whatever. Uh, that's kind of like more of like a physical burnout. But, but yeah, I, I, I can think back, way back, when I, at, at my old church, I served there like about nine years. And I remember one Sunday counting how many Sundays I, I served, like consecutively. And it was like in the 300s. Like I, I easily served over 300 Sundays back to back. And after a while, I mean, and I love that church. It's an amazing church. I actually visited not too long ago. They're doing well. Um, but it, it became a job. Mm. And I lost my, my passion, my fire mm. uh, for, for, for serving the body. And, yeah, that, that was a, the beginning of me believing in, in doubt, doubting and, and definitely, you know, making the wrong decisions in my life. Mm. Uh, but, yeah, definitely wow. I can attribute. With you just talking just now, I can totally attribute that dark time of my life to, to that moment, for thank sure. You. Thank you for sharing that, Jean-Marc, thank you. Uh, Joy, what about you? Is there a time that you can think of where you've experienced burnout, you've seen burnout? Yeah, definitely. Whenever I've worn the wrong hat. Mm. So if I've met with a friend and tried to be the counselor, mm. I burn out, man. I don't wanna meet anymore if I have to be the counselor, you know? Or if I try to show up and do something outside of the skill set that God has given me. Mm burnout, it just becomes just this, um, I, I come into the situation wishing I wasn't there mm. and hoping to leave. But when I come in with the right hat on, mm. I enjoy it. So I think wearing the wrong hat causes me to burn out. That's so good. That's so, so good. Um, Ethan, what about you, man? Yeah, uh, I'll never forget a moment in life where it's just a crazy season of life. And, you know, at some point, or now you, you're experiencing just busyness. And I'll never forget just in such an ex, ex, extremely busy season, I was at a dinner and this woman asked me, you know, how are things going? And, you know, I start listing off all my accomplishments and it was just, she just stopped me and, and, and she said, you know, Ethan, she really just like put me in my place. She said, Ethan, I think God wants you to know that he cares less about what you're doing and more about who you're becoming. Mm. And um, it was so powerful and it just like hit me, you know, in that moment um, that I think that's the truth that we get so caught up in doing, 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 what do I need to do? What do I need to do? And that's what I love about this series we've been in. It's who does God want us to become? Mm. And it's this process of becoming the man, the woman that God wants to be. When I become that man, then I get to rest in that mm. and get, get to walk through that with him. Wow. I, I love that, man. Yeah, it's a, a, activity for God can never replace intimacy with God. It's so, so good. I'm reminded of Reinhard Bonnke. And Reinhard Bonnke has a really cool name. Um, but also, Reinhard Bonnke is one of these, these generals of the faith. And Reinhard would do crusades all throughout uh, Africa and South America. And it's estimated that Reinhard, through his ministry over the years, over 70 million people have come to know Jesus from his ministry. And Reinhard passed away not too long ago, but towards the end of his life, uh, he was asked a similar question. Reinhardt, aren't you afraid of burning out? Uh, Reinhardt, I mean, you're still going at it. You're still going strong. You've accomplished so much. Aren't you afraid of burning out? And Reinhard Bonnke said this. He said, you only burn out when you've wandered too far from the flame. You only burn out when you've wandered too far from the flame. Church, we've got to get close to the flame, and we've got to stay close to the flame. And I believe a strategy and what the Lord shows us is this new concept that I had never been a part of in the 17 years that I've been a part of a fast, which is feasting. Feasting. You see, because fasting will help me make the success goals, but feasting helps me keep the success goals. 
And so we may have fasted for 21 days, but we need to feast for 365 days. Every day we must feast because when we feast, we get close to the flame. Now, I'm not just making this up, by the way. Let's look at this in the scriptures, and I've never seen how these two passages of scriptures connect together. So I'm going to start out in uh, the book of Matthew. And to set this up, Jesus is really at the end of his fast. He's right where we are, but he's been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. And now he's in the desert, in the wilderness. It's not just meats and sweets. He's, <laughs> he's out there in the wilderness by himself. Uh, Matthew 4 uh, and verse 3 says, And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. And so Satan comes to him now, and it's the same strategy, the same game plan, the same thing. The first thing that he tries to do is to get Jesus to doubt and throw him off. Well, if you really are the Son of God, why don't you do this? And I love Jesus' answer because the enemy there was, was, uh, was asking Jesus, was trying to get Jesus to doubt in two different areas, his spiritual and his physical. If you really are the, the, the son of God, command these stones into bread because I know you're hungry. And I love Jesus' response in verse 4. He says, but he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Didn't even address the if you are the son of God. He's like, you know who I am. <laughs> you know who I am. But in my physical man, I cannot live by bread alone, but by every word out of the mouth of God. And so how do we stay close to the flame? We stay close to the flame by feasting on the word. Feasting on the word of God. 365 days a year, feasting on the word of God. The words of God as well, too. So this isn't a, we have to become super religious and every day we check a box for three minutes a day. This is what are you allowing yourself to think? What are you allowing yourself to hear? What are you allowing yourself to listen to 365 days a year? Because if we can feast on the word, then that helps us stay close to the flame. But like I said, we've got the cheat codes, guys. We've got the strategy. And so we already know what's coming next. So the, the conversation continues with the enemy in Matthew, 5, in Matthew 4 and verse 5. It says, Then the devil took him to the holy city, and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. On their hands, they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. So what we see here is if we want to stay close to the flame, we stay close to the flame by feasting on faith, feasting on faith. What do I mean by that? Well, I believe that sometimes the hardest things for us to believe are the best things about ourselves. Those are the hardest things for us to really believe, which are the best things about ourselves. Let me say that a different way. I've needed faith to get through a situation. I have definitely needed faith, and I've prayed to God to help me with my job. I have needed faith, and I have asked the Lord to help me navigate things with my family. But where I need the most faith is to know that I'm a priest, that I, I'm not what I've done before. I am chosen. I am set apart. Let me say that to you. You are a child of God. God has not forgotten about you. The will of the Lord is the safest place for you to be. Sometimes the most faith that we can have is when we start believing what God has said about us. And so the enemy took Jesus on this high place and said, hey, God said he would take care of you. Throw yourself off and he'll catch you, right? Didn't he say that he would? Jesus didn't need to test God to trust God. And so for all of us, as we continue to feast on the word and we feast on faith, I believe we're going to get to a place where we actually start believing the things that God has said about us. So easy for us to believe the things that other people say about us. We walk with that burden. 
That's the easy part. That's the 65, 80, and 97% is really, we really believe what people say about us. But when we can start believing what God has said about us, that's when we stay close to the flame. And then I want to read this last passage of scripture for you. This is the, this is the, 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 the tail end of, of the temptation and the serpent coming to Jesus. Matthew chapter 4, verse 8, it says, Again, the devil took him to a high mountain and showed him all the kings and kingdoms of the world. And he said, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan. Be gone, Satan. I love that. Underline that in your Bible. <laughs> For it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and, and him only shall you serve. Now, I thought the story ended there. And typically, every time I've heard a sermon on this passage of Scripture, it really stops there. The revelation stops there. Is Jesus kicked the devil off the table, and that was great, and he won, and he beat the enemy. And I think sometimes we set the success too short of the goal mark. I don't believe that the success of any trials that we, can, we come across is that we defeat the enemy only. I think that's a part of it. I think this is the greatest part of every time we overcome or every time we have breakthrough in our lives. And it's this one verse, verse 11. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. That's the prize. The prize is the fellowship with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The prize is not that we defeat hell, but that we feast with heaven. That is the prize. And so we stay close to the flame by feasting on fellowship. We stay close to the flame by feasting on fellowship. So we started this whole conversation off with the match. And we had this match, and we struck the match, and you start off on fire. You do. And then that fire fizzles out very, very quickly. I've got a video, though, that I want to show you. And this video was recorded when we did our Secret Place album. And the Secret Place album, not only do we have the songs where you can go, and when you want to get close to that flame, actually on the Harborside app, when you open it up on the bottom, the secret place, the icon is a flame. <laughs> it's intentional. When you get to that flame, yeah, you've got songs to help you pray, songs to help you adore. But we also had a visual representation of what happens. And I want to show you that visual representation right now. In the simplest form, if the fire stays on the match, the fire burns out. But when the fire gets attached to a flame, the flame rises. So you and I, when we're separate, we're just a match. But when we come together, when we come together, We're a flame. We're a fire. Simple match, little breath, fire goes out. But if you've ever been camping, you know that when you've got yourself a campfire, even when the winds come, it at, the fire grows. So when challenges, when situations come in our lives, if we are alone like Eve in the garden, the fire goes out. But when we get connected to one another, doesn't matter what happens, doesn't matter the situations that come, we grow stronger and stronger and stronger together. That's why we need each other, guys. We don't come to church to check a box, not because it feels weird, you know, on a Sunday morning to not watch online or come in. The, no, we come together because we need each other. We need each other. We have the strategy of the enemy. The goal is to burn us out. 
The goal is to blow the fire out. The, glow, the goal is to get us disconnected and alone, separate. But we have the opportunity to feast together. We have the opportunity to come together. So I, I want to end today with really just asking um, one, one question. And um, Tom, I'd really love for you to answer this question because, Tom, you've, you've been in ministry for decades and you have pastored so many people so well. And so many people are in this room because of you and your ministry. And um, I didn't get the opportunity to know you before you before I came to Harborside. Exactly right. But I, I've heard all about you through the mouths of the people that have. And Tom, as I, we're talking about feasting on fellowship, have you noticed any, what, what, what's a benefit? What's the benefit that you've seen when we come together? Well, thank you, Amos. Tremendous presentation of the gospel this morning. Fellowship is absolutely critical to spiritual growth. Critical. Salvation comes and takes place individually. We all must decide what we want to do with the claims of Jesus Christ. Spiritual growth always takes place in community. Mm. Always. Mm. Now, that doesn't mean we don't have alone times. Obviously, we do. But there's a reason why Jesus said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as is the habit of some. There's a reason why he said, it's not good to be alone. Even society recognizes that. But when we come together in fellowship and spiritual growth takes place, mm. you know, one of the things that we, what happens to us in spiritual growth is we always think we're right about everything. Maybe not you, Amos, but I always think oh, I want my first preference, you know. <laughs> But when we come together in spiritual growth, when we come together in fellowship, we learn to understand each other. We learn to understand that we must work together to accomplish some kind of a goal. I don't always get my first preference in spiritual life and things we do or in other things, but I learn from everybody. I've taught a Bible study actually until COVID. I taught a businessman's Bible study for over 20 years. And even though I was the leader of that, Almost every single week, I came home with a nugget of truth that I had not thought about. I grew because of the people who were in that group. Mm. Spiritual growth and fellowship keeps us from becoming selfish. It keeps us from saying it's all about me mm. because it's about us. Amen. It's about the family of God. There's never been a time that's more important for us to come together than right now in our nation and spiritually together so that we can present the gospel to people who are hurting and divided and really need the truth of God's word in their life. Amen. Fellowship is critical. Amen. 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 You know, tonight at five o'clock, we have the opportunity to come together, to come together and to build that bonfire, to come together and to build that campfire, to come together and experience the flame, the presence of God, all of us together. Even online, those of you who are watching us online, oh, we miss you so much. We really, really miss you so much. Really, we, we, we need you. We need you and we need all of you to come together for us to unite as a church, to lift up the highest name there is, to lift up the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and to let this smoke rise. Let this smoke rise all over Safety Harbor, all the way up to the heavens. When we come together, we don't burn out. When we come together, we keep the fire going. And then in our groups, in our connect groups, the connect group series is about the secret place. My goodness, it's all about how do we keep our flame and our fire alive? Church, we are not gonna be the 65, the 80, or the 97%. We're gonna be the church that gets it right because we stay connected to one another. So as we get ready for communion, 
and we take this bread and we take this juice. What I think is so, so interesting about the passage of scripture in Matthew where Jesus is being tempted by the enemy is Jesus was alone. There was nobody else around. So I got to thinking, well, how do we have this in the Bible? And the only thing I could come up with is because the Lord revealed it to his disciples. It was that important for Jesus to get this word out, that there is a strategy from the enemy. Without this passage of scripture, there really wouldn't be much hope of what we can do to defeat the doubt, the disbelief, and the distraction. Jesus gave us the manuals to stay close to the flame because it was that important for us to experience the flame, but also experience the reward of fellowship. When we come together, we get back to the garden. And that's what Jesus did on the cross. He provided us a path, a path to come back into fellowship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, a path to get back into God's kingdom. So as we eat and as we drink, let's meditate on this truth. So five o'clock tonight, let's come ready to worship. And then again, in our connect groups, let's not let the fire go out. Let's keep burning with the flame. Let's all stand as we pray. And uh, babe, why don't you close us out with a word of prayer? of your presence in us and we ask this morning humbly that you continue to work in us to will and to do what pleases the Lord help us to fan the flame in our secret place and in our meeting place and we will be faithful to give you the glory in Jesus name we pray amen amen Thank you.